Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Syrian United Methodist Church. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on another beautiful, beautiful November morning. Glad to see everybody here. Got a few announcements in the bulletins that I want to draw your attention to this morning. Uh, coming up this afternoon at 5 o'clock is our administrative board meeting for the month. This will probably be the last one of the year, if I remember correctly. So if you're part of the administrative board, please be here for that. Uh, next Sunday, I will be on vacation. Uh, Jana Cavanus, um, I said Shelton, will be joining us to bring in the, the message, and we'll only have the 11 o'clock service next Sunday. So no, um, no 9 o'clock service, just the 11 o'clock service. November 23rd, we will have our Thanksgiving service. We're hosting White Hill, yeah, White Hill Presbyterian. And we'll be joining together here, so plan on being here uh, the 23rd, that's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, for the Thanksgiving service. And then on the 25th, uh, we are having a Thanksgiving dinner for anybody in the church that's in need of a place to celebrate Thanksgiving and, and do it with a group. Lisa, what would you like to add to that? Just please let me know if you'd like to come and what you'd like to bring your family tonight. Yeah. Uh, so far, we have about 12 people coming, and um, I think there's probably a couple more that will let me know today. So, thank you. <laughs> and then uh, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, so on the 27th at 9 o'clock, we'll be decorating the church for Advent and Christmas, as, as is our tradition. And it is far, far more than any one of us can do. But when all of us get together to do it, it not only goes pretty fast, we have a pretty good time. So I invite everyone, encourage everyone who can be here on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, 9 o'clock in the morning, to decorate the church. Are there any other announcements this morning? All right, well, if that's it, then let us uh, quiet our minds and our hearts as we enter into this time of worship, and Ralph will play us.
please turn to page 777. Our Psalter this morning is Psalm 42. We pray this together responsibly. I will lead with a regular print. As you can will respond together with a bold print. Number 777, Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went to the throne and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving. A multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Holy God, whom again I shall praise, my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. He calls to me at the thunder of your all your greatness in the Lord By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night God's song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I move? Because of the oppression of the enemy. Like a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me. They say to me continually. Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Holy God, whom my name I shall praise, my, my God. Amen. Please be seated. This past week, we uh, observed and celebrated Veterans Day. I know that's a, a special day in the lives of many here uh, who have served in the past. Um, I've never been a part of a church that has so many former sailors, but not any other. A um, whole bunch of Navy men here. Um, that is a special day, and in my family, we've got a lot of uh, veterans who are, have served, a lot of veterans who are in the middle of serving right now, and we've got a lot of friends. So we want to take a moment to, to say thanks to our veterans, to thank God for those who have been willing to serve. And let's just observe a moment of quiet to remember uh, those who have made the open sacrifice, and I encourage you during this moment quiet uh, to lift aloud any names of veterans uh, who have served, who have um, still serving, or who have made the open sacrifice. James Cole, Sandra Smalls, James Walsh, Clyde Holy Jr., Lynn Belmont, Walter Harris, Edward Harris, Jesse Stiles, Father God, for all those who have served, for all those who have stood in the breach, for all those who have risked their lives and given their lives for our safety, we give you thanks. And we entrust all our veterans and all our current serving military personnel into your hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. What joys do you have? What are you thankful for this morning? I had a relaxing. I didn't get a chance to get the flowers in the bulletin in time, so I won't. Anyway, they're given today in the name of the Lord. 
glorify the Lord. And I, I want to honor my church family with the flowers as well as my pastor. And I thank you for last Sunday. It was a great day, one of the highlights of my life. Just one of them. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> last Sunday was a joyful occasion, and afterwards, I hope I didn't talk with my mouth full, but I was just excited to see people sit across from them, meet with them, and bell shoes and share. What else? What needs our prayers this week? Tell me, Eric, you know, our prayer list when he passed away, he can live with Eric family. Yeah. Definitely need to be praying for our country. Amen. Larry has surgery Thursday. Fun. <laughs> Just can't get enough of those surgeries, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Right, let's go before the Lord in prayer. As always, I will lead us in this prayer, and I encourage you to pray along with me. And then the time of silence to lift aloud the names and situations that are on your hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have given to us, this beautiful fall weather for the cooler breezes that are blowing, for the clear skies above us. Thank you for these walls that surround us to keep us from the cooler breeze. This place where we can sit in comfort in your house, where we can worship you freely, openly, and lovingly, where we can share with one another our lives. Lord, our lives are so full of good things. Even in the midst of hardship, our lives are still full of good things. And all good things come from you. So now guide us into your presence with thankfulness on our minds and on our lips. Seeing the blessings that you have poured out on us that we have taken for granted. Let us enter into your presence, admitting that we do not belong in your presence. That we are here because of your grace in our lives and no other reason. Lord, left to our own, we are dead in our sins. So help us to see our sins as the death sentence that they are, and help us turn from them. Guide us to confess our sins completely before you. Help us to cease calling wickedness good. Help us to cease excusing our own sins. By your grace and your Holy Spirit, raise us up out of our own darkness, out of our own sin, and lead us to live righteous lives for your name's sake. Help us to be vessels of your grace and mercy carried out to this world. Help us to be voices of your good news spoken to this world. We pray for the ministries of this church. We pray for the ministries of all churches. That we may all work together hand in hand for your glory and the building up of your kingdom. We pray for your people wherever they are this morning, however they are gathering, however they are worshiping, and here with us, online with us, or in some other place. We ask that you will touch all of your children, that they will know your love for them. We especially pray for those who are hurting today. We lift up those who are ill in body, those who are facing surgeries and treatments, those who are in recovery, those who are told they will not recover. We pray for the mentally ill, the schizophrenic and anxious and depressed and bipolar and borderline, and so many more who often suffer in silence and even shame from the shit path. We pray for the broken heart, those who are alone and isolated, those who are afraid. Those who are grieving and filled with sorrow. We ask that you heal bodies, minds, and hearts. We ask that you 
do our relationships with them. Guide us to give forgiveness. Guide us to ask for forgiveness. Heal our homes and families and friendships. Heal our church and our community. Heal our state, our nation, and our world. For all of you to heal in this day, we pray. Together we praise you who listens to our prayers. Together we praise you who are high and mighty and exalted and came to be down here with us today. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose life, death, and resurrection has given us abundant life in ways beyond our understanding. Together we join our voices, praying the prayer that Jesus told us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. We us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Now, I mentioned when we were uh, making the announcements that when it comes time to decorate the church, it's more than any one of us can do. And I pretty much say the same thing every Sunday, that the ministries of this church are more than any one of us can do. This morning, I was uh, responding to an email that I got from a lady living in the community who doesn't attend the church, but is looking for uh, an opportunity to do good this holiday season. She wants an opportunity to, to help feed a family or some such, and start to list all the ways that we are involved in feeding families. We've got the blessing box. We've got the garden. We've got our work at the bread basket. We've got our work with family promise. We've got the upcoming Thanksgiving dinner. It's a lot. It's more than any one of us can do, but that is what God has called us to do, to work together using all of our various gifts, using the various time, our various talents, various opportunities to do good in this world, build up God's kingdom. It does take all of us working together. So as our ushers come forward to take up the tithes and the offerings, I encourage you to give to this work, to give so that all of us can be at work together, to give of your finances, to give of your time, your talents, your gifts, and your energy, to give out of obedience to the Lord. And our ushers come forward.
please be seated. Our scripture this morning just comes uh, from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. We want to look at verses 1 through 8. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And Jesus said to him, You see these great buildings? Not one will be left, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, for the end is still to come. For a nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pains. The word of God for us, the people of God. That's right. Holy Spirit, as you are here among us, so to speak to us. Speak into our minds, speak into our hearts. Change us from the out, from the inside out, that we may live according to your will. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Last night, when I went to bed, my, my left shoulder was a little bit aching. I don't really know why, because I didn't do anything heavy lifting or, or anything like that yesterday. My shoulder just kind of ached when I went to bed. Anybody have something like that? Good man. <laughs> Earlier this week, I was uh, I had a load of firewood that I had to move and stack, and everything went well. And then I made a big mistake. I sat down. You know the problem with sitting down is you gotta get up again. <laughs> Apparently, this is what I come to realize: thirty-eight is the year that he crest the hill. That's what I come to realize. My right hamstring is just permanently sore. A few weeks ago, when the weather turned cold, you know what happened? <coughs> My feet turned cold too. <laughs> they ain't warmed up yet. <laughs> I know. I said something to my dad about it. I said, you know, 38 is when you crest the hill. He said, son, every year that downhill just gets faster. <laughs> Things fall apart. Our bodies fall apart. <clears throat> I think I'm just going to go ahead and get a walker just to be prepared. <laughs> I actually have a cane, thank you very much. <laughs> Things fall apart. Jesus did not say a whole lot about the future while he was here on earth. He didn't really talk about the end time. So when we get to this chapter in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, which is commonly called the Little Apocalypse, we get to this chapter, we tend to sit up and listen and pay close attention to it. Because we want to know what's going to happen. We want to know how it's going to happen, and we definitely want to know what, when is it going to happen. Countless Christians have spent countless hours pouring over this passage and other apocalyptic writings that are in the scriptures, all in this attempt to, to parse out and glean some sort of knowledge about the end of the world. You know, it would really help us, though, if we actually understood what an apocalypse is. Because we really messed up. When we hear the word apocalypse, we think of the Apocalypse, capital A, the end of the world, the end of days. We think of armies of demons and angels going to battle together. We think of the four horsemen riding out in terror. We think of these strange demon locust things coming out of the pit, all this other imagery that we associate with it. And we try to make all the stuff that we know match up with the stuff that we can guess. And we read this section of Mark, this little apocalypse in Mark, and we try and figure out, okay, well, how does that fit into the other? And some parts of it line up nicely, but for the most part, when we read any sort of apocalyptic writing, we're just 
continues to buy. And a little bit scared of it. Actually, the failure on our part, both in our approach to scripture and in our understanding of what apocalypse actually is. You see, the word apocalypse does not expressly refer to the end of the world. I have to pronounce the wrong letter in capitalized. Apocalypse does refer to an ending, but not necessarily the end. Apocalypse is some sort of ending, usually some sort of a, a violent or traumatic ending that changes things. And apocalyptic writings, especially apocalyptic writings in scripture, are concerned with how these events unfold. Apocalyptic writings in scripture is a heavenly perspective of ending things, not end times, but ending things on earth. And instead of our folks being on the times part of it, when and how and what are the signs, our attention should be on what is God trying to say to us? Not in the future, but here and now with these words. You see, Jesus' little apocalypse, we can read this and we can look to the future, we can try and tie this in with the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, and we can get really confused. Or we can just look back in history and realize that the very thing that Jesus said was going to happen, happened about 40 years after Jesus said it. He's very good at that. In the year 70, the Romans got really, really tired of Jewish revolts happening around Jerusalem. They got tired of sending in their armies to squash down those little rebellions, and so they decided to just do away with them once and for all. If Jerusalem is the center of all these problems, guess what? Get rid of Jerusalem. And so the Roman armies came in 70 AD and they tore down the walls of Jerusalem and they tore down the temple. So what Jesus said was going to happen literally happened. Not a stone was left on top of another. And here we are almost 2,000 years later, and guess what? It's still out there. Not a stone is left on top of another. This was an apocalyptic event. Many, many people were killed during this. And many, many more were forced to flee for their lives. And this was the creation of what's called the Jewish diaspora, which we still have today. The fact that there are practicing Jews all around the world comes from this event. Rabbinic Judaism, as we know it today, comes from this event, from literally a Pharisaical teacher being snuck out of Jerusalem in a fall. Not only that, this event is what forced Christianity to become a worldwide religion. You know, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, all right, you're going to stay in here in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes, and then once the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to spread out. Well, guess what? They stayed put. Jerusalem was the central location for Christianity until there was no more Jerusalem. And then we had no choice for this for now. 2,000 years of history has really been shaped by that moment in time where Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem. And Jesus predicted it. These are true events. True remaining effects on the worlds. And Jesus warned of it all. But if you notice in this, Jesus does not really seem to be very concerned with the apocalypticism of it all. He gives the disciples no signs to look for. He gives them no time frame. He doesn't even tell them, okay, when this happens, this is what you're going to do. In fact, when Jesus was asked by the disciples for those signs and for that time frame, Jesus instead answered, watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out that no one will see me. <clears throat> Jesus is not concerned with his followers counting down the days until the apocalypse. Jesus does not want us to be out here watching for signs and portents, trying to figure it all out. In fact, Jesus actually warns us against doing that very thing, against getting caught up and looking for all those things. Don't let anyone deceive you. Jesus says, and then he explains just how we can be deceived. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, Jesus says, but don't let that bother you. Wars will happen. Nations 
will rise against nations, kingdoms will fight against kingdoms because, well, that's what nations and kingdoms do. They go to war with each other. There will be earthquakes in various places. Because well, earthquakes happen. There will be famines. Because famines happen. There will be pain and suffering in this world because, well, pain and suffering happens in this world. Do not let anyone deceive you, Jesus says. If you went out to your car right now, you turned on your car radio, you started going through all the stations, whatever stations you got. I like how I'm turning you on. I'm turning the dial on the radio is the one you do. You go through all the stations on the radio, FM, AM, either one. I guarantee you that right now you could find at least one person, probably more than one person, on that radio trying to deceive you. There's a good chance that they're trying to deceive you in Jesus' name. There are a lot of deceivers out there. Many claim to be speaking for Jesus. Many claim to be representing the calls of Jesus. Some are preachers and some are spiritualists. Some are politicians and political commentators. Some are athletes. Some are celebrities. Some don't even know how they got to be famous. Some are just people that you're going to meet in your day-to-day -day life. There are people all around us who are trying to deceive us, and a lot of them are trying to do so in the name of Jesus, or trying to represent the calls of Jesus. But Jesus tells us, do not let yourself be deceived. One thing that I have seen is those who are actively working to deceive us. They tend to have one big tell in common, something that you can always observe and know, okay, this person, something's not right. Because most of the time, nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, the people who are trying to deceive you tell you what you need to be afraid of. To tell you who you need to be afraid of. They try to sell you a fear. Be worried about this group. Be worried about these people. Be worried about those things over there. Be worried about that nation. Be worried about this future. Be worried about these Bible verses. They try to sell you a fear. And then once you fall into that fear, well, then they sell you a solution. You know what that solution usually is? To give them some sort of authority in life. To give them some sort of power. To give them more votes. To give them your dollars. Whatever it is. They sell you fear. And then they sell you a false solution. Christians, why do we fall for this so easily? Why do we buy into the lies that the deceivers are selling to us? Why do we listen to people claiming that Jesus wants us to be afraid of others, that Jesus thinks we should be afraid of the future? It makes no sense. Because if you actually read your Bible, if you actually pay attention to what Jesus says over and over and over, he says, do not be afraid. Even in this chapter, the little apocalypse, Jesus tells the disciples, and we keep on reading, he tells them several times, do not be afraid. Do not be troubled by this stuff. Do not be worried about this stuff. Of all the people in this world, Christians should be the least susceptible to this kind of deception, to these false teachers who are out there. We should hear those slick, serpentine lies those who claim to be speaking in the name of Jesus and actually are doing the work of the devil. We should hear them and we should know them for what they are. Yet we fall for it over and over and over again. Jesus tells us, do not be deceived. He also says, be prepared. Now that's something else that Deceivers would have to do. Be prepared. Be prepared for the apocalypse. Be prepared for the end time. Build yourself a bunker. Pack up a, a bug out pack. Load up your shelves with canned goods and dry beans, or in the case of COVID, apparently toilet paper. 
the snow apocalypse is coming. You better get the milk and bread. Apparently, we all want French toast when it snows. Jesus does not give us those kind of instructions. Jesus does not say to prepare in that way. Jesus does not say this is how you avoid the apocalypse. This is how you vote to get out of the apocalypse. This is how you hide out until the apocalypse is over. No, Jesus says be prepared. Specifically, be prepared for his return. And that sort of preparation has nothing to do with laying by supplies or building up our fences. Every summer, Jessica and my girls will go out to the West Coast to spend two, three, sometimes even four weeks out there with her family. That means that every summer I have a few weeks here at home by myself, which I admit that I enjoy. Glad when they come back, but it's kind of nice and quiet when they're going. Now, if I live in a sitcom and my wife and children went away, then in that sitcom world, I would spend those weeks living in my own filth. Right? We've all seen those shows. The mom goes away, the dad just never changes his clothes. There's piles of chip wrappers and everything else around the refiner, the TV's been on. He just sleeps wherever he falls. And then, uh oh, mom's coming back. She'll be here in an hour. I gotta do what? Clean everything up, right? Y'all, I don't live in a sitcom. That is not the way that I live my life. When Jessica and the girls are gone, I don't spend that time living in squalor with the hope of in the last minute throwing everything together and getting all the money. In fact, when they're gone, I actually spend the entire time that they are gone preparing for their return. Now, that does not mean that I spend the whole time cleaning up, okay? I have discovered this amazing thing. When my kids leave, I can clean up and it stays clean. It's an amazing thing. So yes, there is cleanup involved, but the rest of the time that they're gone, I'm not wallowing in filth. I'm taking my trash out. I'm washing my dirty dishes. I'm not eating nothing but junk food. I'm eating the same kind of healthy food I eat when my kids are there. I'm changing my clothes and doing my laundry on a regular basis. I've been doing that since I was a kid. What's more important though, while they're gone, I talk to them every day on the phone multiple times a day, especially when just on board. We exchange text messages all day long. The whole time they're gone, I spend preparing for their return, talking to them, letting them know I love them. Taking care of the hats because this is where they live and this is where they're coming back to. Feeding the fish because those fish are my responsibility to care for. They can come back at any point and they're going to find that house ready. And they're going to find me ready. The same ought to be true about Jesus. We're not supposed to prepare for Jesus' return at the last minute because we never know when the last minute will be. We don't know when the historic last minute will be. We don't know when our own personal last minute will be. We're not supposed to stock up on our earthly goods because what does Scripture tell us? We're not going away anyway. Not one stone will be left on another. We prepare for Jesus' return by living out Jesus' teachings, doing the things that He said to do, taking care of the things, taking care of the neighbors. That Jesus has given us responsibility to care for. We prepare for Jesus' return by speaking to him often, by listening to him, by learning to love. And that's an amazing thing because perfect love casts out fears. Right? Praying, studying scripture, Obeying Christ's teachings, these are the only way that we can be prepared for Christ's return. This is also the only way that we can be ready for any kind of apocalypse, big or little. Because make no mistake, you will face an apocalypse in your life. All things end. There might be some kind of catastrophe, like the destruction of Jerusalem, like a hurricane coming through, like a global pandemic. But even without something big, there's lots of little things. Our bodies deteriorating constantly, especially after you turn 38. 
No matter what, you will face an apocalypse. You will face an enemy. The question is not when will it happen or what are the signs that this is going to happen. The question is, will you be prepared? Will you spend your life speaking daily with the one who was there before the beginning and will be there after the end? Will you spend your days immersing your mind in the scriptures to know what it actually says in there so you can't be deceived because you know it too well? Will you spend your life obeying the one who said to love your neighbor as yourself? Will you be prepared or will you be deceived? Let's pray. Father, open our eyes to see the deceivers for what they are. In your perfect love, may all of our fears be driven out. May we rise up to trust you. Oh Lord, you've proved yourself so trustworthy. Help us to be prepared at all times and at any time for your return. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Let's prepare ourselves for the week that lies ahead by singing together our closing hymn number 377, It is well with my soul. You may stand as you are comfortable, number 377.
this benediction. Do not be afraid. Do not be troubled. Do not be worried. Do not be deceived. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.